Marks and Keynes, The Limits of the Mixed Economy by Paul Matic. Chapter 20. State Capitalism and the Mixed Economy. While Marx's theory of accumulation covers the mixed economy, it seems to lose its validity for the completely controlled capitalist economy, i.e. state capitalism or state socialism, as represented by the so-called communist societies of the Eastern power bloc where government decisions and economic planning determine production, distribution, and development. These societies are not the product of a slow transformation from a mixed to a state-directed economy, but are the direct outcome of war and revolution. In practice, they have continued and extended the state-directed wartime economy. Theoretically, they regard their activity as the realization of Marxian socialism. This is somewhat plausible because they adhere to an orthodox interpretation of Marxism, which sees in private property relations the main or only condition of exploitation. Actually, the conditions which Marx expected to result in the expropriation of capital did not even exist in the industrially underdeveloped nations engaged engaged in social revolution. Their leaders were convinced, however, that total state control over all of the economy would bring up would bring about a more rapid capital development than would be possible under competitive market relations and that this more rapid development under the auspices of socialist governments would enable a slow transition to socialism the development of capital production in the name of socialism or communism is a paradox too far fetched to have entered marx's mind Yet from the vantage point of the present, it is not strange at all. Although constructed with an eye on England, which, at that time, represented capitalism in its most advanced and purest form, Marx's model of capital production represented neither the national nor the world economy, but was an imaginary system of basic capital-labor relationships. The actual development of capitalism brought with it a variety of more or less developed capitalist nations, colonization, and imperialism. Yet the world economy was inextricably interconnected with and dependent upon capital expansion in the dominating capitalist nations. In underdeveloped countries, revolutionary theory had to relate itself not only to still existing pre-capitalist conditions, but also to the overriding capital-labor relations that dominated world economy. As there was no way to develop new independent national economies except in opposition to the monopolistic powers and their fetishistic capital expansion, the ruling capitalist ideology could not serve national revolutionary needs in backward countries, the less so as their own pre-capitalist ruling classes secured their existence in close collaboration with the imperialist powers. Even though it could serve no more than national capital development, the revolutionary ideology had to be an anti-capitalist ideology. And as the carriers of this ideology operated in the 20th and not in the 18th century, their concept of progress by way of capital production was no longer associated with private enterprise and general competition, but with the highly concentrated mixed or state-controlled economy of modern capitalism. Able only to reach those social conditions that Marxian socialism intended to eliminate, they could see themselves as Marxists by assuming an engagement in two revolutions at once. The bourgeois revolution, which created the capital-labor relations of modern industry, and the socialist revolution, which prevented the determination and utilization of this development by private capital. Though carried out in the name of Marx, the state capitalist or state socialist revolutions would be better described as Keynesian revolutions. What is usually designated as the Keynesian revolution is Keynes' recognition and acceptance of the fact of intensive state interventions in the economy. It is only because of Keynes' preoccupation with mature capitalism that the application of this theory has reformatory rather than a revolutionary connotation. But as a measure of reform, stopping at the mixed economy, it is self-defeating, 
for it slows up but does not prevent the destruction of the private enterprise system. Arising at the same time as the mixed economy, the state capitalist system may be regarded as Keynesianism in its most consistent and most developed form. It is not a mixed economy in the limited Keynesian sense of safeguarding private capital <clears throat> by way of government controls, but it is a mixed economy in the projected wider sense of a comprehensive socialization of investments geared to the promise of alleviating the prevailing inequitable distribution of wealth and income by leaving it to the common will embodied in the policy of the state to determine how far it is safe to, to stimulate the average propensity to consume in a full employment, crisis-free economy. Moreover, state capitalism remains a mixed economy by being part of a world economy still largely determined by private profit production and by virtue of the fact that it is marked by all the antagonisms that characterize private capital production except that of private profit appropriation. Whereas the mixed economy in the narrow Keynesian sense is limited by the nature of private profit production, in its wider sense, as a complete state capitalist system, it is limited by international capital competition. In theory, state capitalism should allow for a nationally planned determination of both the volume and the direction of production. The kind of planning actually undertaken is, however, determined by the needs of capital production within a setting of international capital and power competition. The possible advantages of complete government control can be only partly enjoyed, and the fate of the state capitalist economy remains bound to the fate of capitalism in general. Its economic expansion is not, the, not of the type which characterized the rise of capitalism, but of the type characteristic of its decline. Overproduction in the form of waste production and relentless power competition now accompanies the early stages of capital formation and even that of primitive accumulation. As in the capitalism of old, the accumulation of capital, not the real needs of the producers, determines the direction of production. As capital formation is a concern of government in the mixed as well as in the state capitalist system, what, in the Keynesian view, divides capitalism from socialism is merely the degree of government control. But as capitalism, according to Keynes, has the tendency to socialize itself, socialism is now defined as a fully socialized capitalism. In this sense, state capitalism represents socialism, and is generally recognized as such by spokesmen of the Marxist and anti-Marxist camps. The dissolution of the private property system through capital concentration and corporations, some of which are units which can be thought of only in, some, in somewhat the way we have heretofore thought of nations, change the capitalist economy into something which differs from the Russian or socialist system mainly in its philosophical content. Contrarywise, it can only be argued that if the word capitalism is still used for the economies of the Western world, it, not, it ought not be used to describe only the private ownership of capital. It ought to describe any community which believes in steadily increasing its wealth-creating capacity by a constant investment of resources in productive capital. So defined, there is nothing controversial about capitalism, since the leading examples in today's world of progress by capital are the United States and the Soviet Union. Already during the Great Depression, President Roosevelt realized that what we are doing in the United States are some of the things that are being done in Russia, and even some of the things that are being done under Hitler in Germany. But we are doing them in an orderly way. Because of the affinity of the mixed to the state capitalist economy, their actual enmity is now largely related to philosophical differences that are supposed to determine their political institutions, but not their socio-economic structure. To be sure, Orthodox Marxism maintains that the mixed economy is still the capitalism of old, just as Orthodox bourgeois, bourgeois theory insists that the mixed economy is a camouflaged form of socialism. 
Generally, however, both the state capitalist and mixed economies are recognized as economic systems adhering to the principle of progress by way of capital accumulation. During the Great Depression, Keynes deviated from this principle and envisioned an early change of emphasis from investment to consumption in a society of capital abundance, which would render superfluous the socialism conceived by its founders and adherents. It was precisely this deviation which distinguished his theory from the orthodoxy of his contemporaries. After the war, however, bourgeois theory insisted again on an accelerated rate of capital formation. The extraordinary progress in Russia with its distinct capitalistic tendency has contributed to this general change of attitude and has greatly impressed the rest of the world. Never before has a people imposed upon themselves such severe restrictions in order to accumulate savings to be converted into real capital. It is now clearly realized that this immense display of Russian power is based on an abundant supply of capital created by an abnormal reduction in current consumption. Everywhere, people are demanding an economic policy which will lead to a progress similar to that in Russia. While in the capitalistically less developed nations, this masochistic demand comes to the fore in various attempts to emulate the Russian example, in the highly developed capitalist nations, it takes the form of frantic attempts to reach Russia's higher rate of capital formation. It also brought the question of growth to the forefront in a rather shamefaced return to political economy, which characterizes current bourgeois economic theory and practice in its new concern with the macroscopic aspects of the economy and its dynamics. However, contrary to Marxian theory, bourgeois theory holds that capitalism has proved to be reformable and is now securely on its way to solving all remaining social problems. There is, then, no need to see in the class struggle the motive force of social development, or even to approach still existing social evils from a class position. These evils may be dealt with as general human, not specifically social, problems. This point of view may, by the way, help explain the recent vogue of the socialist humanism of the young Marx, who considered the alienation of labor and capitalism a result of the alienation of man from his true nature. This un <clears throat> this unmarxian Marx, well well fits the welfare state. It can even be used in the ideological war against the ideological Marxism and of the state capitalist adversary. At present, moreover, there exists a tendency to view the developments of both the Soviet and Western systems as converging, pointing, uh, as converging, pointing to the eventual establishment of a socio-economic structure as much removed from free enterprise principles as from those of the regimented economy. The Soviet system, the Soviet system, the Soviet system does not remain the same. It is said, and neither does the Western. And neither does the Western system. Both are moving, and the movements are generally converging ones. It is no longer true, the argument goes on, that the systems are diametrically opposite. They have already many features in common. Elements from each can be combined, leading to new mixed systems. But while both systems undoubtedly agree on the importance of capital formation, they disagree on the far more important question as to what particular social layers are to be its beneficiaries. As regards this question, nationalized capital is the opposite of private capital, even though, as regards the producers, both forms of capital production thrive on exploitation. This common point encourages the empty hope for their eventual convergence, but they remain divided on all other issues. The nationalized economy is no longer a market economy, even though it may retain or reintroduced some quasi-market relations subordinated to overall government control. Good or bad, it can actually plan its production and distribution, although the nature of the planning itself is co-determined by internal necessities, the world market, and the changing requirements of imperialist competition. 
the strictness of the opposition between private and government ownership of means of production, between market-determined and consciously regulated capitalist economy, seems to be contradicted by the existence of the mixed economy and its projection onto the international scene as a possible harmonious coexistence of different social systems. Yet an indefinite, peaceful coexistence of state capitalist and market-oriented economies is no less illusory than the indefinite existence of the mixed economy as a market economy. In fact, it is precisely the advancing state control and the private enterprise economies which accentuates the conflict between, between the two different capitalistic systems. The wars between identical capitalist systems have made it clear that capital competition turns its imperialistic competition or turns into imperialistic competition and that wars would occur even if there were not a single state capitalist nation. The Second World War demonstrated the feasibility of temporary alliances between state capitalist and liberalistic systems of capital production, but it demonstrated at the same time their fundamental irreconcilability, based not merely on newly arising imperialistic interests, but also on the difference between their social structures. Far from bringing traditional capitalism closer to state-controlled economies, the advent of the mixed economy intensifies the enmity between the two, if only to curtail the expansion of state control in the market economies. Capitalism will not turn itself into state capitalism, and it would be just as difficult to make a state capitalist revolution as it is to make a socialist revolution. Since a conscious organization of social production presupposes the expro expropriation of private capital, the transformation of the mixed economy into state capitalism can only be a revolutionary, not an evolutionary process. In thought, of course, it could be otherwise. In a democracy, it is not entirely inconceivable that a government may come to power committed to the slow or rapid national nationalization of industry. But such a government would be a revolutionary anti-capitalist government insofar as capitalism is identified with private ownership of the means of production. In order to realize its program, it would be forced to displace the market system by a planned system. As far as the capitalists are concerned, this would be their death warrant, and it is not easily conceivable that they would accept it without protest. Most likely, the complete nationalization of industry would lead to civil war. It is fear of the social consequences of extensive nationalization which prevents those ideologically committed to it from actually attempting its realization. Although there is no precedent, it is not inconceivable that a state capitalist system could be instituted with capitalist consent. The mixed economy would then have been a step in this direction. Keynesian reforms and political movements associated with them may bring about a social climate in which the nationalization of essential industries may appear inescapable, or even a good thing to a majority of capitalists. Arrangements may be made to safeguard property rights in terms of income, while delegating control of production to national agencies. Various socialization schemes based on capital compensation are aimed toward this end, to be achieved within the legal structure of political democracy. Nationalization of industry, however, no matter how capital owners may be compensated, amounts to their abdication as a ruling class, unless, of course, they regain this position as members of government. Compensations are based on the value of the capital turned over to the state, but accumulation now becomes the accumulation of national capital, and decisions over the employment of surplus value become the decisions of government. Compensation comes out of surplus value but cannot be productively accumulated to private account. The income it represents is secured by nothing but the goodwill of government and the latter may at any time repudiate this claim to unearned income and complete the expropriation of private capital. Whether by consent or by revolution, the nationalization of capital ends the class rule of private capital. Hmm... I heavily disagree with this chapter. The disciples of state capitalism can, if they wish, have an easy time recognizing the inconsistencies 
and aimlessness of the neoliberalism of the mixed economies. They can point to the fact that capitalism is continuously changing in the direction of state capitalism. For a long time, however, they were not willing to conceive of peaceful abdication by power groups in the interest of the general developmental trend. The Bolsheviks, for instance, never had the illusion of a frictionless side-by-side -side development of capitalism and socialism. Nourished by the war alliances between democratic and totalitarian nations, and by the growing similarity between, between the Keynesian welfare state and the state capitalist system. They were convinced that the transformation of a partly controlled, <clears throat> partly controlled social system of capital production into authoritarian state capitalism involved social struggles, and if they envisioned a future world unity, they saw it in the image of their own social system, and thus defended the latter as much for the sake of world revolution as for its own sake. Convinced of their progressive calling, theirs is an optimistic attitude, and their policy is dynamic in contrast to the neoliberal attempt to arrest the development at whatever particular point it happens to find itself. Of course, like any social group, the Bolsheviks too can blow hot or cold. Coexistence allows for a variety of interpretations, and so does the content and strategy of Marxism. The latter has often been played down. This was the policy during the Second World War, for instance, to allow the Grand Alliance to discover a previously non-existent harmony between Russia and the anti-Nazi Western world. And this policy also suited Russia's internal needs, as she required at that time a return to traditional ideologies to support the war of national liberation. On the other hand, with the end of the war and the extension of Russia's power, the oppositional character of Bolshevik ideology and practice was stressed once more, and Russian communism was revived with the help of Western anti-communism. But at the time of Stalin's demise, Russia took the initiative in attempting to moderate the world situation. In view of the precarious international situation and the still more precarious conditions in Russia, Stalin's death was an event capable of leading to great disturbances internally and abroad. His successors sought a reduction of tensions in both areas. In the first, by scrapping the internal course planned by Stalin, and the second, by an apparent willingness to open the socialist market to capitalist trade. Concord between Russia and the Western world is, of course, the hope of people horrified by the prospect of a new and more devastating war, and of those who envision a future reconciliation between East and West on economic grounds. They recognize that any rapport demands decisive changes in both the East and the West, and they try to help them along by developing the appropriate ideology. They tend to believe that the industrialization of totalitarian nations and their increasingly and their increasing ability to trade will transform them into more democratic systems, more akin to modern welfare capitalism. A partial abandonment of Marxism is urged upon the Russians in the interest of their own survival and final success. Marxism for our time, it is said, exhausts itself in a full employment program, though not necessarily in the Keynesian fashion. But as private capital relations are declining anyway, there is no need to stress the inevitable. The general trend in the direction of a regulated economy will on its own accord on its own accord serve Bolshevism better than a senseless harping on bygone issues of expropriation and capitalist collapse. And if the Russians are not able to change their ideology, they should at least grant others what they deny themselves. Marxist propaganda in the old capitalist countries, it is pointed out, would not necessarily lose in impressive strength were it clearly stated to non-Russians, non-Chinese, etc., that the further evolution of their national ways of life cannot simply be derived from the experiences made by civilizations with a completely different background. In this view, Bolshevik propaganda would be more successful would be more successful if the claims for maximum realization of the original Marxist pattern were dropped. Because with the receding of the egalitarian approach in the Marxist camp, the desire for wholesale nationalization, as distinct from that of the commanding heights of economics, 
has lost its raison d'etre. By looking at the hands of Bolshevism rather than its mouth, Western capital may then find little reason to oppose the, the totalitarians, because their social system seems not too different from the future of its own. This is not a one-sided matter, of course, for while the Western world tends to adopt many of the innovations of state capitalism, the Bolshevik East seems to adapt itself to the ways of the West. Thus, some ideas which sprang from early communist preferences but proved difficult to apply have been given up. It is no longer held that workers can manage productive units by themselves, that all incomes should be more or less equal, or that money is superfluous. Incomes are geared to productivity and money concepts are increasingly used in planning. Interest, though not recognized as a possible source of private income, has gradually been accepted as representing a real cost element. The value of an international exchange of products has been increasingly understood as some autarkic preferences weakened. Some decentralization in economic decision-making has been introduced and consumption has been given more attention in the new party program. Mathematical methods in economic planning at first considered bourgeois are now increasingly applied. However, just as it is highly improbable that in the absence of social revolution the market economy will slowly transform itself into a planned economy, so it is equally improbable that a once nationalized economy will return to capitalist market relations. Well, that's obviously not true. The restoration of the market would mean the restoration de facto, if not de jour, of private capital. In the Western capitalist nations, there exists the false concept of a people's capitalism, by which is meant a system wherein a wide dispersal of stock ownership results in a division between the ownership and the control of capital. The alleged divorce between ownership and control supposedly turns the non-owning managers of industry into acting capitalists. If the functions of the capitalists can be exercised by management without ownership, the rewards of ownership may also become the rewards of management. Although hardly likely, it is not inconceivable that the managers of Russian industry, in collaboration with the government and with the consent of large layers of the population, might proceed to restore a competitive market economy based on profit production, in the sense that each enterprise would operate as any private enterprise does in the West. As before, government would siphon off the equivalent of its own requirements from both paid and unpaid labor by way of taxes. But this would constitute a private capitalist counter-revolution under the guise of a managerial revolution and would at once reintroduce into the Russian economy all the contradictions which are imminent in competitive private capital production. What a private enterprise economy can engage in, short of social revolution, is a form of pseudo-planning, and what the nationalized economy can restore, short of social counter-revolution, is some sort of pseudo-market. Either case, that of spurious planning or that of spurious market competition indicates the existence of difficulties within the market system or within the planned economy. In combating these difficulties, however, the use of instrumentalities which, despite their possible temporary usefulness, are foreign to the respective systems and their special needs will have to be arrested in time if the system's basic characteristics are to be secured. There is no congruency between the planned and the market systems, even though some economic technical arrangements, in distinction to socio-economic relations, may be common to both. All the state capitalist systems resemble the capitalist market economy in their maintenance of capital labor relations and their use of capitalistic business methods. Instead of being owned by capitalists, the means of production are now controlled by governments. The latter set a certain value, in money terms, on productive resources, and expect a greater value, in money terms, following the intermediary of production. Money wages are paid to the workers, whose function it is to create a value greater than that represented by their wages. This surplus is allocated in accordance with the decisions of governments. 
It feeds the non-working population, secures national defense, takes care of public requirements, and is reinvested in additional capital. All economic transactions either are exchange transactions or appear as such. Labor power is sold to management of some enterprises, and wages buy commodities from management of other enterprises. There is quasi-trade between the management of some enterprises and the management of other enterprises, like that which is carried on between the various divisions of large corporations in all capitalist nations, and which reaches its complete form in the fully centralized state economy. Formally, there is not much difference between private enterprise and state-controlled economies, except for the latter's, de- the latter's centralized control over the surplus product. All actually existing state-controlled systems were, or are, to be found in capital-poor nations. The first requirement of such nations is the formation of capital, a presupposition for their national independence and a precondition for the intended socialization of production and distribution. Bound more or less, depending on the country and its particular situation, to the capitalist international division of labor, they must relate their economies to world market conditions and partake in international commercial competition. This limits or excludes any desire they may have not to make the money economy and its expansion the motive force of their activities. The socialization of the means of production is here still only the nationalization of capital as capital. Though private ownership no longer exists, the means of production still have the character of capital because they are controlled by government instead of being at the disposal of the whole of society. Although private capital accumulation is now excluded, the exploitation of men by men continues by way of an unequal system of distribution in both the conditions of production and the conditions of consumption. This inequality perpetuates competition as a struggle for the more lucrative positions and better paid jobs, and carries the social antagonisms of capitalism into the state capitalist system. (sighs) State capitalism is still a surplus value producing system, but it is no longer a system which finds its regulation through market competition and crisis. The surplus product no longer requires market competition in order to be realized as profit. It derives its specific material character and its distribution from conscious decisions on the part of the state's planning agencies. That these decisions are co-determined by the international economic and political competition and by the requirements of accumulation does not alter the fact that the lack of an internal capital market demands a centrally determined direct system of decision-making with regard to the allocation of the total social labor and the distribution of the total social product. Under these conditions, the use of quasi-market relations is a convenience, so to speak, not a necessity, even though it may have been forced upon the state capitalist systems by circumstances they were unwilling to resist. In the USSR, for example, the quasi-market relations provide enterprises with a quasi-autonomy, consumers with a quasi-freedom of choice of consumption, and workers with a quasi-choice of occupation. But all these quasi-market relations are subordinated to overall direction by government. Within definite limits, this restricted free play of market forces can be extended or contracted without seriously affecting the planning system as such. It is presently being extended in the belief that this will make for greater efficiency without diminishing the effectiveness of the planning system. This involves some decentralization of the decision-making process and more self-determination for individual enterprises in support of the overall direction of the economy as a whole. The goal is not to change the character of the economy, but merely to provide it with greater profitability through a more extensive use of capitalistic techniques of incentives. Individual enterprises are given more leeway in determining their production processes so as to fulfill and excel their planned production quotas. A greater regard for consumers' preferences is expected to aid production plans and to eliminate waste. 
Interest charges on borrowed capital are supposed to lead to great, greater rationality in investment decisions. Wage differences within the plant are left to some extent to the discretion of management. Portions of the profits made through higher productivity and improved organization may be retained by management and reflected in wage increases. These and other innovations are intended to accentuate what has always existed, namely the use of capitalistic incentives and state capitalist economy. They do not affect the control of investments by government, nor its control of total social production and its division in accordance with a general plan. Wherever the outcome of these innovations does not suit the general plan, a government veto can change the situation either by decree or through a change in pricing policies. The limited free market can at any time be suspended by the real power relations which stand behind the pseudo-market relations. It should be obvious in any case that at a time when not even the private enterprise systems are able to exist except through extensive government intervention, no state capitalist system will find itself on the road of return to private enterprise. In fact, the only advantage of the latter over the former type of system consists in its complete control over economic affairs, which compensates for its economic ineffectiveness vis-a-vis the highly developed private capitalist systems. The state capitalist system does not suffer that particular contradiction between profitable and non-profitable production, which plagues private property capitalism, and which offers it as an alternative to stagnation, only its slow destruction. With this destruction already behind itself, the state capitalist system may produce profitably and non-profitably without facing stagnation.